Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Institute for Government for this joint event between the Institute and the Centre for Public Scrutiny. Um, when Jess and I were talking about this event, we thought, what do, what do our two institutions have in common? And the two things we found were sort of commitment to thinking seriously about decentralisation of political power within England and thinking about effective governance and accountability. So we've tried to bring those two things together in this event today. And there's not much better time to do it when we can look back on five years of pretty significant reforms in terms of the local landscape in England with the arrival of PCCs, changes like such as GP commissioning, the abolition of the Audit Commission and so forth, but also look forward to an era of further decentralisation given the political commitments that all parties have made to go further on this and the underlying dynamic we can see not just in the England but in the wider UK context in relation to devolution to Scotland in particular. Given where we are, it's a good time to have three different perspectives on where we are. Um, we've got three fantastic panellists for you, and I'll introduce them in the order that they're actually going to speak in this event for about 10 minutes each. First of all, we have Jessica Crow, who's the Executive Director of the Centre for Public Scrutiny, and she'll set out where she thinks the current landscape is and what some of the big challenges are. Then we'll have Joe Miller, who's the Chief Executive of Doncaster Council and also was formerly a Deputy Chief Executive at the LGA. And she'll set out her personal experience of accountability at the sharp end, uh, having had Eric Pickles as uh, warm embrace for a number of years and have recently taken that council out of the special <coughs> regime that he kindly put in place for her. And third, we'll have Sharon White, who will share a central government perspective on some of these issues and think about some of the, the barriers <coughs> to decentralisation that might be there and ways of overcoming them. We're very lucky to have them all. Um, after their contributions, we'll have a little discussion amongst the panel and then throw it wide open to you to join the discussion. And then after that, probably at about, where are we now? Uh, probably at about 6, 6 15, 6.30ish, we'll probably uh, go out and carry on the conversation further over drinks and nibbles on the landing. Probably the best bit. <laughs> then, uh, before I ask the Jess, uh, Jess to kick off, we'll, we'll just do some housekeeping stuff. So, we are online, so at IFG events, uh, Centre for, Pub for Public Scrutiny, hashtag there, and that's our wireless network and our username and password. We're also on the record. This event is being recorded for posterity. Um, David Laws was in here yesterday saying it would take seven days to form a coalition if uh, one had to be created in 2015. Uh, it would be interesting to see how long it does go on and whether people play that message back on loop if it takes a little bit longer. So, um, without further ado, I think I should hand over to Jess. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. So, stand here and this is actually a very nice um, lectern that's not too small, uh, not too high rather, um, it's always a challenge for me. Um, so uh, thank you very much and thanks very much to the IFG for um, hosting this joint event. As Tom said, we, we um, think we've, we've definitely got some things in common. And so what um, I'm going to talk about is this um, patchwork uh, that I, I think we, we, we've seen um, that's built up over a number of years um, and it, which is becoming ever more complex. And I guess before getting into that, I did want to say that although um, what you do with your power and resources is ultimately, of course, more important than the structures of government that you use, um, uh, and we, we absolutely believe that, and as um, I think Barry Quirk wrote in the LGC recently, you can't get into discussions about what power and resources local government should have without being clear about what local government is actually for. Um, but I think for CFPS and the Institute for Government, um, our interest is in how you use those structures in government and how your approach to government you know, ultimately does affect what you do with your powers and resources. So that's what we're going to focus on, um, whilst not uh, uh, denying the fact that you know, the, the outcomes and the delivery are, are, are probably more important in the long run. But what I want to talk about is these uh, different forms of governance and decision-making bodies, different kinds, different levels of accountability that we, we've got now. And I guess w one question to pose is, does it matter that there's this uh, patchwork, that there's this complexity? But if, if, so, if we might think that some forms of governance are, are better than others uh, and more account accountable, should we try, be trying to get to a more uniform approach? Um, there was a, a, an interesting suggestion from two Liberal Democrats just um, this week. Uh, one uniform approach would be to abolish all councils and replace them with 150 local parliaments. So do we want a whole kind of, you know, tear it all up and start again with a single approach? Um, and I'm also going to describe, though, to start off with, some definitions of accountability and principles that we might want to use to assess whether some of these forms of government and approaches to government are better and more accountable than others. 
And I think it's important to try and define what we actually mean by accountability, if we're going to be thinking about what you know, for something that's more accountable means, um, because it is a contested concept. Um, and I think it's really, and often misunderstood, I think it was really well described by Tony Wright, who was um, Centre for Public Scrutiny's first chair, really well in a collection of essays, which are copies out there, and I commend it to you. Um, but he said, we, we, you know, we absolutely don't want more <laughs> scrutiny and accountability, but it must be better. Um, uh, scrutiny and accountability if we want better government. And he, he argued in, in all the issues and scandals of the last 10 years, a consistent theme is that better scrutiny would have helped prevent what happened. Um, and he, the paradox that he describes in his essay is that over this period when we've seen essentially more forms of scrutiny and accountability emerge, we've also seen he, all these scandals and loss of trust. So it's not about more, it's about better. But I think this, um, the perhaps more... Um, nuanced definition rather than the, the DCLG definition at the top there is this thing about it, <coughs> it being a relationship where there's an obligation to explain and justify, you can pose questions and pass a judgment and there may be consequences and I think that's a, a really important, all of those elements are part of, of accountability. I wanted to, to go through this kind of um, all these different governance arrangements that form part of this patchwork so we'll start with one of the new boys which is local enterprise partnerships and it's one of the issues here is that they, there are overlapping partnerships, uh, overlapping boundaries, so some areas are in more than one LEP. Um, they've got very mixed governance with business leaders and, and local authority leaders, um, and uh, one lead authority taking responsibility for managing funds on behalf of others. Um, so, and I think there are questions emerging about their accountability and their transparency, whether there are conflicts of interest in how those funds are managed. So there's questions there. Moving on, we have the joy of ac accountability and governance in the NHS. Um, so there's a variety of health and social care bodies which now exist to commission and deliver health and social care. 211 co clinical commissioning groups uh, working to commission care according to strategies set nationally by NHS England and locally by 151 local health and wellbeing boards. Um, and as you can see by looking at the numbers that those things don't correspond to each other. Um, so more overlap, more mixed form of governance. On CCG <coughs> boards you have clinicians and lay people. Um, health and wellbeing boards are statutory committees of local authorities but include council employees and people from outside the authority alongside elected members who also have a role to hold some of those people to account. So that's um, I think uh, a bit complicated. And if we look at this um, diagram produced by the Department of Help, Health to help us understand the system in the NHS, I think you can see the complexity even, even more vividly, and please don't try and read it or understand it. Um, um, but I think, you know, for patients and the public who, um, I think, you know, nicely for the department, they put the patients and the public right at the centre, um, clearly issues of transparency and simplicity for the patients and the public sat in the middle, and equally difficulties for Parliament holding officials throughout the system to account and knowing who has responsibility for what. And I, I don't know if you saw, there was a really nice illustration, um, uh, quite h hilarious actually, of, of this, um, a recent Public Accounts Committee hearing where Margaret Hodge was, Hodge was extremely grumpy about the fact that she had to have seven or eight different officials from the DOH, from NHS England, various other places in front of her to talk about the Better Care Fund, all of whom were apparently vital to ensure that all the questions could be, could be answered. And interesting, there was only one person required from local government, which is Carolyn Downs from the LGA. So, uh, you know, it is a very, very complex system which perhaps makes accountability more difficult. And moving on um, to local government uh, itself, we have the sort of the newest kid on the block, if you like, combined authorities, which now everybody wants. Everybody wants one. They're the kind of latest thing. They're sort of like frozen memorabilia for local government. Um, everyone has, has something. Um, although there's only five of them, um, and only two of them have got um, any uh, semblance of, 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 you know, greater devolved powers in Greater Manchester and Sheffield, which I'm sure Joe will, will talk a bit about. Um, and they've been successful in negotiating a degree of devolved powers. Um, but there have been you know, reports of a dozen or so areas who are seeking to create them at different, different levels. Some of the five overlap with their LEP and their accepted sort of functional economic area. Some are bigger, some are smaller. They mostly involve a board of council leaders with some opposition representation to get sort of political balance. And they've been encouraged by government to ensure there are scrutiny arrangements and to take account of, of those. I have to say in practice from what um, CFPS has seen in the work we do with local authorities, a number of these sorts of joint scrutiny arrangements are, are really quite weak. Um, and you know, people struggle to connect local representative roles with the bigger strategic landscape going beyond their 
um, understood boundaries, <coughs> and they used to tend to be used as opportunities for passing on information rather than genuinely challenging sessions, where if we remember the earlier definition, there are questions asked, judgments made, and consequences. Um, so I think there are, there are some weaknesses in, in that system. And a question that's really also been on the table since the first elected mayor in England was introduced by the Greater London Authority Act is whether directly elected leaders are somehow more accountable than indirectly elected ones. And there's a, a widely held belief amongst think tanks and many in central government that they are, but they, this view is not shared by most people at local level. Um, uh, in the referendums that have been, um, you know, where the proposal's been voted down and a reluctance amongst council leaders to act as turkeys. Um, arguably, the poor turnout in the 41 Police and Crime Commissioner area elections um, a, a year or so ago, and, and some of the idiosyncratic individuals that have been elected in some local authorities have undermined the arguments about the strength of direct mandate, but you know, the Metro Mayor that's been agreed from Greater Manchester um, is clearly seen as, as the way forward to get more, more powers devolved. Um, so, and I think one of the other things that you can see from both this and earlier slides that one that the forms of governance that have developed have really focused on executive side. What do we need to enable basic decision making to happen, which is understandable, but then it sort of leaves the scrutiny and accountability elements as an afterthought. Um, you might have noticed in the earlier slide that health overview and scrutiny committees um, had to be added by us to the diagram that had been left out by the Department of Health, despite the key role that those bodies have in challenging uh, hospital reconfigurations and changing the provisions of the provision of hospital services. Um, so something we've been proposing at CFPS to plug that gap for future models of devolved decentralised governance are sort of things, something like a place-based local public accounts committee, which could function as either a top-tier single authority level or a combined authority level where, where one exists. And we think this does offer a, an understood model. It's a single, high-profile, simple um, point of scrutiny. It's a way of sharing governance um, and, and getting something that's, that's, that's joined up and enables that accountability to happen in a focused way uh, in the way that the Public Accounts Committee does in Parliament. But I think um, whatever the format or model, the crucial thing is that we need to address the problems ca caused by the patchwork. And I think the, this, this is the DCLG accountability system statement, which just ignores the patchwork completely. Um, and <laughs> just... Um, please don't try to read it, by the way. Um, it takes across two pages of a, of a document. But it describes a, a, you know, a simple departmental system where the only lines of accountability are from the accounting officer to parliament, from local authorities to the department, and other departments completely separately, and a single line of accountability to the public through things like elections. Um, but you know, is this sufficient for capturing the kind of complex picture that I've been describing, where all these different bodies spend public money in different ways? So I think there is um, some evidence uh, of growing concern that the current system is creaking at the seams. So the National Audit Office, the Public Accounts Committee and other select committees have been criticised um, and are called into question whether the government is really able to track the taxpayer's pound and the risks that accrue in a system where there is this complexity and a range of people having a say over how other organisations' funds are spent. Um, and so I think you know, there, it is timely, certainly, to, to look at the existing arrangements. And I think from, from our point of view, despite our, our structural proposal around local public accounts committee, the solution in the end is unlikely to be structural. It's, it's got to be about um, leadership and culture and attitude, which is borne out um, from a, a recent survey we carried out where um, seeing even in the current situation at local level, controlling obstructive leaderships and weak compliance scrutiny. And at the root of this really is the un an unwillingness of leaders to accept the value of challenge as part of good decision making. Now, good leaders, strong leaders um, really understand that and, and are confident in their ability to withstand challenge and use it as a way of improving. But I think there are too many in leadership positions who don't agree with that um, and, and seek to control it. And so I think this is the one of the key issues to address is how we develop our, our leaders for the future. And then just finally to leave you with some, some principles which might help guide both the behaviours and structures for future um, processes of devolution and decentralisation and could maybe be used to test some of the proposals that are going to come forward over the coming years, as Tom suggests, if these um, proposals for more decentralisation move forward. And we, there is a need to test and assess whether they are likely to lead to better, more accountable government. And I think we would say then there are some key principles around transparency, around involvement, and around accountability, all of those three things together in how um, organisations might work. So is it 
uh, an open approach to decision making and are, is, are the arrangements clear about how performance and outcomes will be assessed? Is there a commitment, a genuine commitment to involving the public across the area to help people really understand what's needed across that, that local area? And do, do the leaders accept that real accountability and effective scrutiny you know, will help them demonstrate their credibility, build support for tough decisions in tough times and, and manage risk? And I think the key element, as I've said, is about culture and attitude of those with the power wherever it's going to be exercised. Can you hear me at the back? Yeah, that means I'm switched on. Well, this way anyway. Um, I was appointed as, as Doncaster's chief exec by Sir Derek Pickles um, uh, three years ago, actually, uh, last week, and, and Doncaster was some way into its intervention. But um, before that, uh, while I was at the LGA, I helped design the nature of that intervention, uh, in which Jess was one of the commissioners. Um, uh, in, in actually a, a, in a co-designed intervention in my previous role at the LGA and I think there's something that I want to feed through today around co-design and collaboration. Um, I wondered how I might tie the start and end of my day together uh, and the journey in between in answering this question. Uh, I took time out with the directors of the council I work for this morning to think about uh, where having been the kind of poster boy for badness in 2010 and quite some years before uh, in, for local government, uh, to now being, um, I'm going to do a little bit of a shameless plug here, uh, certainly shortlisted for being the most improved council of the year this year, what that means for us in terms of a place whose ambition is high, whose challenges are enormous, uh, and how we, in a world where by 2017 we'll be operating with 50% less than in 2010, how we kind of squeeze the best bang for buck out of all of our our leadership team to meet the challenges ahead. So you'll tell me at the end whether I've succeeded, but I'm going to have a go. Um, so Doncaster, um, when I'm selling the, the borough on an international stage, I tell them it's north of King's Cross, because of course in international terms it is. Uh, and it is only 90 minutes from London, which in Sydney is a day out. Um, it's part of the uh, Sheffield City region. Uh, a borough of 310,000 people. I'm a little bit obsessed about the elections in May because we have at least one high-profile candidate. And if any of you wasted half an hour of your day reading the mail on Sunday, you'll know a little bit about my life this week. Um, so part of the combined authority, also a mayoral authority. And interestingly, when those referendums were held asking if people wanted to have a mayor or not, um, Doncaster voted to retain its mayor. Everybody else voted not to have one with the exception of Bristol. Um, so actually what that meant was that everybody voted for status quo with the exception of Bristol. But interestingly, more people voted on the question as to should we keep it than actually who then turned out to vote for whom their mayor should be, uh, which I think says something. Um, so uh, just, uh, I do think there is something about mayoral authorities that, that gives the mayor, and, and it comes across very strongly actually in our partnerships in what people say, is a real strong mandate for place. Uh, and part, part of our improvement, you know, so you're the mayor for the borough, for the people. Uh, you're not the mayor of the town hall, frankly. Um, and actually part of our intervention story and success has gone from being the, the mayor of the town hall and the master of the people to being the servant of the people and a kind of first among equals in place with a very clear purpose to make sure that that people, that that place and its people thrive. Uh, within the city region, uh, Sheffield city region, it's not a monocentric city region, um, so there are two key growth poles in the city region, Sheffield and south of Doncaster, but there's also other growth in Barnsley and other places. Um, our strategic economic plan says that we'll have 70,000 new jobs, 6,000 new businesses, 30,000 new upskillings, and an increase in GVA of 3 billion, so that's all pretty easy because we haven't managed that in the last uh, 30 years. But that just gives you an idea of the context um, in which we're operating. Um, so the question we're asked is, will, will decentralisation mean better, more accountable government? Well, I believe and well hope so. Um, but the answer is that it depends. And what I would say is that when I think about the times we were in plenty, you know, the state is broken. The state we are in is not a good state to be in. And we are all the state and we have to get more out of the state in a land where, as I say to my staff all the time, 
there's no more money, there's not going to be any more money for the rest of my operating, you know, my working life, but that's just the operating weather. We can uh, do it better. So, and, and like Jess, actually, the, the, the answer to that is not structural in my view. It's about leadership and behaviours, and that's how I'm going to try and tie my day together. I'm going to tell you two stories. Um, I hope they're both relevant and topical. One is about growth, and the other one is about winter pressures um, that I think might describe how um, decentralisation might work. So, and there, was a, there was a big site at South Doncaster. It was an old RAF site, and it became Doncaster Airport. Um, uh, it, uh, in 2004, uh, the highway, uh, DFT and the authority designed a, a, designed a new spur off the motorway that would uh, improve life at the airport, make it grow, unlock housing land, unlock employment land, etc., etc. Six years that was in design from 2004 to 2010. So there were lots of people locally and centrally involved in that at a cost of, mm -hmm. conservatively, about £2 million. Pounds. And then there was a moratorium. So six years in the planning and didn't happen. And then, actually, one of the best things about austerity, along came RGF. Um, and I've got to tell you, the cost of that road in 2010 was £110 million. Pounds because the, the DFT and the Highways Agency were told, if you have lots of new businesses and lots of new houses, how gold-plated does that road need to be? And so the cost of the taxpayer of that road is going to be £110 million. Pounds. Central money, local money, doesn't really matter. It's all taxpayers' money, 110 million quid. RGF comes along, the Regional Growth Fund, and the government say, we need some shovel-ready projects. Who's got one? So in eight weeks, we put a funding bid in, and instead of being how beautifully gold-plated does the road need to be, the outcome for everybody in DFT and highways agency and locally is, how can we achieve growth? with the minimum amount of money. So, the £110 million scheme becomes a £56 million scheme. That's how much it was re-engineered. The funding bid that was put in, we asked for £16 million worth of RGF, and the council put in £4 million of its own money. Eight weeks later, the bid's approved. How do I get to £56 million? Well, I get the other £34 million out of the private sector who are going to benefit the airport and the businesses um, from, from that development. So, six years and a cost of over two million quid and basically the square root of jack all happening. Uh, eight weeks later, we have a funding bid uh, approved by government. Twelve weeks later, we have um, all the risk sharing in place with the private sector. Twelve weeks after that, we have planning permission to date that, site, that, that, that project, the first round of RGF, is on site. It will complete in February 2016. It will um, create, ultimately, over 10 years, 20,000 new jobs, 5,000 new homes. It will unlock £1.7 billion worth of private sector investment and will add 3% to the Sheffield City Region GVA by 2030. But more importantly, that £110 million scheme has cost the taxpayer 20 million pounds. That's not about structure and that's not about devolution, it's about putting in place the behaviours to do sensible deals quicker. Uh, so that's my first uh, devolution story and actually how the council's role in that was to bring those partners together, to bring the city region together and if in decentralisation you just followed that kind of old assurance tool, do you remember those old assurance tools and that red book that you had to go through to get all the money? Nothing would change. So that's why I say it's about doing things differently. I'm going to tell you about winter pressures as well, because that's quite topical. Is anyone here from health? No? Okay. So, um, so January 2011, Doncaster uh, Hospital stopped taking A&E um, uh, patients by ambulance on several occasions. A bit like we are now. 57 discharge delays, 76 medical people sleeping out, 126 cancelled operations. Uh, discharge staff working from three separate organisations, working to five discharge lists. They all had separate processes and procedures, and all the patients had to talk to loads of different people to get their answers. Um, the council had the, was one of the biggest outliers in the UK for um, people in residential care, and the CCG had, uh, was also one of the biggest outliers for spending on continuing health care. So whichever bit of public money it was, that was being spent, 
it wasn't being spent um, very effectively. Um, let's translate that on to now, and we have an integrated discharge team, actually with the integrated discharge team led by the local authority. One team, um, we've invested in 33 social care beds to enable people to be returned to their home, and the CCG have invested in um, continuing healthcare type assessment beds. What that means is, instead of everything happening in hospital, the medical stuff happens in hospital, then the patient is moved to somewhere that helps them get to where they need to be. Uh, it doesn't matter which organisation you work for, you are empowered to make the assessment and deliver the choice. And again, uh, investment of um, a million um, has brought about savings of over 1.5 million, and that's ongoing each year. So it's a little bit irritating this year, if I'm absolutely honest, when I find that you know, the authority, despite its, despite its pressures, has invested in that. It didn't have to say we'll put an integrated discharge lead in, but it did, because it mattered for its people. Um, it invested in those beds. And here we have um, some of the stuff on winter pressures now. And actually what the government does is chuck the money at the places that have the pressures. It doesn't actually say, who's invested? What can we learn from that? So even in the context of that authority failing, um, from 2011, where it was an outlier, um, it is now below the national average on all of those statistics and saving money. So how does that um, then take us to the devolution deal, I suppose, and where we get to now? I think what I would say in both of those cases, uh, and there are many more stories like it, and I'll just tell you a little one about the devolution deal, um, is, it is it is about leadership and collaboration and co-design and making what work and, and choosing what works and replicating it. I don't think the patchwork matters. I think life's always been a patchwork and it will always be a patchwork. In fact, I would go so far as to say that the current obsession with core cities um, uh, is, um, is a distraction and I think is failing to unlock some latent growth in places that are ready and able to do the type of deal that I talked to you about with, with FARS. Um, when, um, when Nick Clegg uh, said that uh, Sheffield City Region could have a devolution deal, and it was a little bit unusual, because it was a bit of a fast conversation, um, but at least we knew two weeks before the Cabinet Office who had to play catch-up, but we, we understand the stage and the electoral cycle and where things are at. Uh, of course, some of my colleagues in the City Region said, do you know what? we can definitely spend that money better than them. Let's just grab the land. Um, but that's the same behaviour that's the behaviour that's a problem. Uh, so uh, the real answer is let's, um, let's redesign uh, the system. So one of the other things I am in the city region is a skills lead. Um, we produce seven times as many hairdressing and beauty cases as there are jobs. And we, re we have uh, to the power of ten not enough engineers and courses to go forward in terms of those jobs and devolution. So you can work out where the challenge is. So I had to uh, back some of my colleagues off in terms of that land grab. Um, I also then had to uh, challenge some behaviour at a central level uh, from a sort of skills funding agency, amongst others, who it didn't matter what the ministerial intention was, it kind of had to be squeezed into a tube, you know, that had all sorts of performance criteria that nobody um, ever intended to be there. So I go back to then, what, what does that mean in terms of um, accountability? And I looked at the start of my day today. I said I'd try and tie them together. And we've identified that the next stage in our kind of leadership journey, because you know it's great to be an improving council, it's great to be out of intervention, it's great to be creating jobs and growth, but there is a lot more to do to serve our people well. And actually, we said that it's about three behaviours. You know, who's accountable? As in who owns the outcome? Who's responsible? Who has to do stuff to make it happen? Who needs to be consulted? And who needs to be informed? And I think if we can think in terms of scrutiny uh, around those types of behaviours rather than structural ones, then we'll get a lot further. You know, if on the... Um, if on the growth thing that I talked to you about, that actually we had to wait for a structural solution around who the combined authority is and who does what, we still wouldn't be on site in FARS. If the conversation about de delayed discharges had been 
let's talk about a pooled budget and let's transfer the staff from organisation one to organisation B, it would be the wrong conversation. So we're really clear in our health and wellbeing board that, uh, that that is system leadership for health in, in our place. And, and uh, our, our Better Care Fund plan was one of the ones, one of the six in the country that got through. I have to say the amount of money that was spent on its oversight centrally was somewhat extraordinary. And uh, we need to make sure that we spend our time doing the doing rather than too much time on the planning. So yes, it can. And I think it's all of our challenge to do it. much and over to uh, Sharon for a final contribution. Thank you. I'm going to sit here. I mean, partly sort of reflecting the fact that I guess I'm not a doer and probably the sort of biggest pen pusher and the furthest away from any reality of anybody in this um, in this room. I was going to just make a few brief remarks. Um, I guess part, partly, principally from a, a sort of treasury perspective, but hoping to give a bit of a, a kind of example as well. I mean, I guess the, the sort of starting point, thinking about. Um, this in a policy terms is just thinking about the UK in relation to other countries. And so, you know, we are you know, almost the most centralised um, uh, developed country in the world. If you look at all the data that's done by uh, the International Monetary Fund or others, lots of work that we looked at in the context of the Smith Commission last year, um, there is both a sort of the, the UK jumps out in terms of the degree of centralisation, but also now there's actually pretty good kind of cross-country data that decentralisation tends on average to be um, more closely associated with both stronger growth and, um, and better public services. And that is not very, very detailed decentralisation, but it's, you know, sort of a more, um, a more federated system. And I think that's a really important um, part of the context. I think the other part of the context is that obviously the, you know, these pendulums swing. Um, you know, I've been a civil servant for 25 years, seen many colleagues um, from different guises around the room today. And um, I was very interested in Jesse's comment. I think one of the issues around the pendulum swinging actually comes back to the issue around transparency, which tends to be an afterthought from the sort of decentralisation, the accountability, and I want to come, come back to that. I mean, the other sort of piece of context, I think, is also this, the degree of variation across public services in the degree to which the public is, is in a sense, comfortable with um, decentralisation. So, you know, Peter, um, who used to um, work very closely with employment service, we have a, if you look at the benefit system still in this country, despite um, closer local working, I mean, the UK, in a sense, the sort of our revealed preference is to have a system of transfer payments, welfare payments, an employment service, which is still very, very nationally determined. We are revealing uh, a preference, actually, if you look at schools, policing, which has always been um, very local, that's where it has its historic roots, much more local. And I think there's a really interesting set of questions as to why, actually, even within the same country, with very different histories, we've ended up with different public services where we've got a greater or lesser tolerance um, for, local, um, for local difference. Um, I wanted to say a, a bit, um, and others will have a lot more to say than me, about how some of the debate runs um, centrally on, 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 uh, on decentralisation. We've got John Denham and other politicians in the room who can talk a bit about this from, from their perspective. I mean, often the conversation starts from political belief or, I mean, ideology is probably too strong a word, um, but a sense in which um, services ought to be more responsive would be better designed, um, would be more sustainable <coughs> if they were closer to the, to the customer, closer to the, um, closer to the consumer. And obviously allied to that is a, you know, is a sort of what works sense. But actually a lot of this, I mean, if you think about obviously where I'm sure David Laws and we've talked about already where the Liberal Democrats are and other parties, a very strong sense that local is by definition better in terms of the design of of public um, services. I would distinguish in that between, uh, in a sense, services where the government says, here is a sum of money, you go off and, and design that, if you look at academies, for example, and where the government is saying something more strongly, which is, we are going to give you more tax-raising powers 
associated with spending for you actually to, to have much more, um, in a sense, sort of fiscal local accountability alongside the, uh, the sort of responsiveness and design on public services, which we're seeing much more in a sense at a nation's level. Clearly, F Smith and the um, uh, devolution that we're seeing soon to be, um, soon draft clauses to be published. Actually, rather different actually from what we've seen in Greater Manchester, which is a slightly more modest, um, uh, more modest relative to Scotland, but more modest in terms of, of the fiscal devolution as opposed to devolution over design of, 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 of services. And I think in the discussion, it would be good to draw out that as a distinction. I wanted just as an example to pick up um, the question about academies in terms of some of the dilemmas, and we've picked picked up some of this with the proposal around local PACs, about why the pendulum can sometimes swing. So academies, I think, is a really interesting example where, you know, obviously started under the previous government, some very, very strong evidence by Steve Machen and others about what works. So you've got a big body of evidence. We've had a strong continuation, a rapid acceleration of academies under this government, where by now we've obviously now got, you know, the majority of of uh, secondary schools outside local government control. I think there is then, coming back to this point about sort of reporting and, uh, and transparency, you know, the degree to which, particularly thinking about Parliament, um, we feel comfortable with that. So, I mean, I'm just very struck by my own experience of being called by the PAC, you know, to give account on you know, the salaries, for example, of individual school heads or the salaries of individual local authority chief executives, because as we devolve, actually that does not stop Parliament's desire, rightly, for a sense of how the money is being circulated and control on actually maybe small sums of money, but totemically important issues as far as public expenditure transparency and control, um, namely senior salaries. So. I think it's just a very, I mean, I'd just be very interested in the debate that follows to try to have a more granular discussion around, in a sense, fiscal devolution as opposed to responsiveness and local design of services, the nations versus regional decentralisation, why the pendulum has, tends to swing backwards and forwards, and whether we can design in some of these questions about better transparency and reporting at the start. Thank you very much, Sharon. Um, I'm going to abuse my position of chair for a bit and have a, just open up a bit of discussion. Um, first of all, is there a risk that we're taking all this political rhetoric around decentralisation a little bit too seriously? Because while we have seen shifts in terms of decentralisation over this parliament, if you actually look at what happened with some of the things that were in 2020 meant to be the great decentralising reforms, many of them lost impetus as political the p political leadership of those got diverted into other priorities and as fundamentally other secretaries of state had bigger priorities than for example creating elected mayors even arguably PCCs in terms of the push that came behind them politically and the funding for the election information campaigns and so forth so we actually see that there are lots of things that lead to promises to decentralize often being underdelivered once you're in government um, are there reasons to think that that's different, really, this time round? And particularly, probably for Sharon, I mean, why, why is that? And what can be done to actually reassure uh, and to create momentum for, uh, for this at the national level? I mean, a couple of observations. I mean, those of you who know, work clo more closely with local politicians will have a, uh, a, an interesting perspective. My own view is I think it's debatable, your opener is debatable as to whether there has been less um, devolution than the rhetoric. And I think partly what you talk about is sort of devolution of political governance and um, people's uh, revealed preference on mayors. Actually, if you look at the degree of uh, decentralization, devolution, if you look at the emerging Scotland settlement, uh, personally, I think that is, I mean, it's very uh, uh, radical. If you look at um, the degree of decentralization greater local accountability around policing. I'm sure Stephen will have views on this, on, uh, on schools, which is very striking. I mean, even on, you know, even on health um, with CCGs, I think one can argue, actually, the landscape 
um, looks uh, looks very looks very different. Now, you know, clearly a question is what works, and whether there's evidence of better public services in more fiscally constrained times, which is obviously part of the information set for any policymaker thinking about the next stage of reform and whether we've got strong enough evidence as to whether these different models actually are providing better services, more responsive services for people, I think is an important question. Does anyone else think it's, uh, we're being over-optimistic here or, or do, you, do you sort of think that actually there is, a, there is potential for this to happen? Um, my feet are firmly planted on the floor. Uh, when um, actually it was Lord John Denham who designed some of the intervention in, in Doncaster, it was through CLG as was then, as I say, it was co-designed <coughs> and it's been proven to work. Um, I'm not so convinced that, uh, that, that, that some of the current interventions will be co-designed in that way. Um, and I should just, so I'm thinking of Rotherham and uh, Tower Hamlets and others, and I should say that um, I, one of the things I should have said earlier, for I'm sure it might be a question, uh, people might say, how can we trust with decentralisation when there are failures such as that? Um, well, for all of those failures, there's a work programme, which is a complete waste of money, and I can definitely spend it better. Uh, there's universal credit, which is also a complete waste of money, and I can definitely spend that better. better. And every other IT system that's wasted an absolute fortune for, frankly, which heads haven't rolled. Um, uh, the reason my feet are firmly planted on the floor is, I'll just tell you about, I mean, two things. Whatever it is, we have to seize it and use it. And um, I kind of don't sit in the corner that says, oh, if only we had more devolution powers, life would be better. Uh, I have to say, I think the notion that um, places... Uh, if I think about local government finance settlements where over 50% of your money is spent on looking after older people, disabled people and children in care, the notion that a grant settlement means you should be self-sufficient in those areas is simply extraordinary. It's beyond extraordinary. If we don't do that in a health service, then why on earth do we do that with those? Um, so I don't kind of waste time sitting around and, and waiting for more powers. I prefer to use the evidence of things like uh, the FARS road, the scheme that I've talked about, as you give us the money, we can use it well and deliver, deliver the outcomes. All that said, um, the devolution deal that Sheffield City Region signed uh, just before Christmas, one of the ones there was, let us spe let's co-design the work programme. We can definitely get more bang for buck out of that money. Uh, I've had to write to DWP this week because uh, somebody from DWP phoned up and said to Sheffield Council, uh, we don't bother, want to bother with that City Region stuff or any of the individual councils. Can we just come and talk to you because we've got a programme, we want to roll it out in March anyway. Um, so, you know, that's why my feet are firmly planted on the floor, and that will not be happening in Sheffield City region, I can tell you. I mean, linked to, linked to one of the points you made, raised there about Rotherham and, <coughs> and Tower Hamlets and elsewhere, where, where effectively you have national government exerting what some would say is a perfectly legitimate right to step in where it sees performance problems or governance issues in local authorities. You see that the, the arrangements there are probably obviously much more ad hoc than the Doncaster arrangement that was, was set up before. You could probably find parallels in relation to academies and chains and, and so forth if you look at Birmingham and elsewhere. Do you think there's a need to look at these arrangements and formalise them and make them more rules-based? Or do you think that's not the right way to go and actually we should have this sort of more politically sort of uh, driven sort of competition between uh, the local electorate's wishes and then nationally elected politicians? I mean, I think I mean, having been also through a, a, an authority that was failing in, in, in intervention under, you know, several regimes ago, um, I think the it has to be fair, but it also has to be a co-design thing. I think Joe's absolutely right about that. And you know, there were, I mean, I tell a story about um, my my former borough's uh, intervention when when it was decided there needed to be directions to direct us to do things. The two things about those directions were, one was that they were largely directing us to do things that we'd already agreed needed to be done. Um, so they were just telling us to do things that we'd already said we would do. And secondly, there was a sort of, sort of I don't know if it was an email went around Whitehall, but everyone, every department wanted a piece. So um, the Department of, um, of Culture, Medium Support, whatever it was called in those days, you know, was like, looking, oh, we want a direction. Well, there was nothing wrong with Hackney's arts offer. <laughs> you know, there was, it was nothing to do with the council's governance failures. But, you know, they wanted the direction too. So, you know, these things can't be just down to the, the, the whim of, of departments and they, and they can't be down to ad hoc. Uh, approaches and uh, you know, uh, and civil servants. I've, I've 
spoken to privately will say it's maybe too soon to talk about resurrecting the audit commission but at some point we might have to talk about that and go well you know blow me what a surprise <laughs> you know and I, I think there has to be some sort of fair system but it also has to be one that is more um, done in partnership with local entities on the ground and trying to support those who do want to change and improve um, to boost them and help them and for every Rotherham and, and Tower Hamlets there are other authorities where the LGA's sector led improvement offer has worked and you know a team of people from the sector have gone in and helped the authority improve itself without the need for intervention and so um, you know those things can can be done um, but it, it's about having some mutual respect I think and treating it seriously. And, and a few people, I think, mentioned the, the sort of public's role, obviously, in, in holding people to account. If that becomes more important in a range of different service areas, and <coughs> then is there anything that needs to be done to support the public in taking, those, taking on those roles, or is that just something that actually we relax about? I mean, if you think about police and crime commissioners, very, very low turnout in those elections. Does that matter? Um, does that make those posts less legitimate? I mean, certainly, I think the fact that, that Labour are, are uh, you know, <coughs> contemplating getting rid of those does suggest that things like low turnout do undermine the legitimacy of institutions. But um, so, so how do you how do you address some of those problems? If this is the if this this is one of the drivers of improvement we've got, who the vote who the public pick? How do you how do you engage the public in some of these institutions? I think it's away from the general public. I think you need real leaders with real powers, and if people feel that their vote matters, mm -hmm. they'll use it. Um, frankly, I think police and crime. And this is not a comp this is not a this is not a comment on our individual police and crime commissioner, but I think they're a complete waste of space. Um, I think if you, um, you know, I, I didn't even want to vote for one, and I was a returning officer. Uh, you know, I'm <laughs> sorry. Oh, I shouldn't have said that. Anyway, so, but, you know. Um, to maximise turnout. Yeah, well, exactly, yeah. Um, it's just one more to count. Um, I, I just think that if you, if, if you, you know, and I, I'm, I'm a person and I live in a place and I use public services and actually some of those public services are great and some of them are rotten. Um, and I want, to, I want um, local leaders who have an accountability for that and are able to change them. I am frustrated in our schools that 16 out of 17 are academies with six different academy chains and they are not good enough. And they weren't good enough when the council had, when they were under LMS and they weren't academies. But the actual, the ability to connect and account to local people is simply not good enough. Mm. Uh, and I am the mother of children at school. Um, and, and I do think that, um, you know, I will say that as a mother of children at school, frankly, some of Ofsted's judgments, you know, actually I know what's wrong with some of my schools and I know what's right. And suddenly going from gr good to inadequate, for one thing, is not what it feels like to be a learner at that school or a mum. Uh, and so, I, but, but that's not to say that there shouldn't be um, greater accountability. And it is, it's transparency. Um, actually, this, my secondary school that my son's at has gone from good to inadequate. And one of the reasons was that parents weren't getting good enough information. Uh, I got Harry's school report home a week and a half ago. And I mean, I think I'm relatively clever and I couldn't understand it. My husband and I had an argument as to whether he was doing well or not so well. <laughs> so God help everybody else. And, and that was because that was seen as Ofsted good, but it was entirely irrelevant to me as a parent and actually to him as a learner. And they're the people we need to account to, our people. And, and we need to be the servant of the people and not the master. I, th I think that's where this, the, the point about patchwork is quite interesting because I think the more complexity there is, the, you know, it, it does make it harder for the public to know where to go. And, you know, the, but this is not a new problem. You know, this has not been created by, you know, by reforms in the last five years. I mean, we had um, Helena Kennedy gave our CFPS lecture some years ago. And she said, you know, people don't know where does the buck stop? You know, where do they go to? Who do they complain to? And so I think there, there is something about some of the, the superstructures being um, being clearer and 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 more consistent, people knowing where to go and being able to use technology to kind of direct people more more easily and simply. And I, I you know I think that is a that is a big challenge. But that it comes as well back to the point about culture. You know there are people who don't who don't want to share information, and that that I think has to change fundamentally. Instead of it being a you know why do you need to know that to be a kind of you know we want stuff to be to be more uh, available, and it's a you know, we, we come up against it all the time in the work we do with councillors where they make, you know, completely legitimate requests for information and people are frightened to give it to them. You go, well, really, what, 
what, what harm is it going to do? You know, if there's commercial confidentiality, if there are legal reasons, if you redact it and you put it into the part two. You know, there's got to be an element of trust and a culture of being more open, and that's for elected representatives and it's for, for, the, for the public as well. And, you know, that's where I think the simplicity and simplifying things has got to really focus. And from a sort of central government perspective, Sharon, I mean, what are the costs of dealing with such complex and diverse arrangements. I mean, if you think about the different arrangements that are in place around the new emerging city deals and combined authorities and all that sort of stuff, what does that actually practically mean for, say, the Treasury in terms of thinking about finances, other departments thinking about their relationships with this diversity, and how ready do you think or how capable do you think Whitehall is of recognising this diversity and, and, and managing it, and what do you think the challenges are uh, given that? Yeah, I mean, I mean, a couple of things, and this is in a sense of more well-worn territories. We've gone through different models of, uh, sort of regional and local entities over the, the years. I mean, if you think about I mean, growth and the right uh, sort of area or regional entity, how one brings together the right players with the right capacity. Um, I mean, I know people have got different views about LEPs and the degree to which you know, they are linked in sufficiently into local authorities and, and sort of boundary issues. But I think from a sort of central government perspective, there is firstly sort of an, almost a sort of economic question about what is a, what makes for a sensible economic um, entity, which has then obviously got the political legitimacy, but also the right players, business and others uh, around that. I think it's, I mean, it's very striking that the Manchester and Sheffield deals have been, I mean, Think about Manchester in particular, contingent on a mayor, and so you know, c clearly one issue is whether you know is whether there is an individual with legitimacy who can bring together um, the players and also, in some sense, speak for the public. I think has been um, very important in the in the recent in the recent debate, but it remains a, it remains a patchwork. But does that mean? Does that really? I mean, just in sort of administrative terms, I thought it would be interesting for the audience because we don't we don't often get into the sort of minutiae of how you deal with um, a, a range of different arrangements in different in different places. I mean, does it does it mean you actually hire more staff? Does it? I mean, do you have actually thought about that that those sorts of questions in terms of the economic impact on the treasury of the diversity? Not saying that would be a reason not to do it, but does it matter? I mean, I think you know a very practical issue with the with the Manchester deal is that you know it's much easier to talk to one person, and you've got a very strong council leader mm. in Manchester. Manchester didn't just happen overnight. It's been a you know it's obviously been a uh, political and economic entity developing for a very long period of time. That makes for a very easy, easy conversation, and Manchester understands Whitehall, mm -hmm. uh, and that makes for a very, very different dynamic and a much stronger <laughs> conversation than, than other parts of the country who uh, obviously that that's, that is evolving. Mm -hmm. So no, we you know sadly we won't be hiring lots and lots of staff, but I think there is a real question about what is the best way to have a proportionate dialogue that actually allows progress within Whitehall, but actually allows progress locally in a way in which people feel there's, there's buying. I think, I think there's quite an interesting paradox in there between the, the, um, the decentralisation that you, you talked about in terms of, um, of academies, and you know, but yet you're still having to answer questions at central level. So it's both a decentralisation and a recentralisation because the middle bit has been lost. And I, I can't see that that can be efficient, that, you're, that somebody in people, number of people in DfE are monitoring the behaviours and activities and finances of hundreds and hundreds of schools. It, it just doesn't seem to me that that can be efficient. And it's certainly not close to, to the public and, and to, to, the, to, to the residents. And I think it does need this, I think we come back to co-design, it's about a partnership and where in my borough has tremendously successful academies and ones that are not so good. And the ones that are having it, is, it has been strong leadership from the authority to reject proposals for academies that we felt didn't um, you know, match the ethos of what we wanted for the family of schools, but then to work really closely with them and to get that kind of shared view of what's best for the kids of, of the borough. And so you know, it's not about rejecting different, different models, but you know, there's, there, there has to be a role for something in between. I think as we started off saying about us being you know, the, the most centralised you know, developed country and is that good for delivery of good public services? And I just, I, it doesn't feel logical that it can be. 
So a very broad ranging conversation there for people to, to spark off. Um, let's go to some questions from, from you. Um, we've got uh, some roving mics with, from Kerry and Lauren. Um, so hands up for questions. We'll take a couple at a time. So maybe we take three, three at a time and then uh, the panelists can pick them off at will. Okay, so we've got, uh, gonna go for Stephen. Hi, Steam Rimmer. Uh, not here to talk about PCCs particularly, <laughs> after what Joe said. Um, uh, I'm just sort of interested in, in Sharon, your point about. I'm really excited by the Manchester model, and I think I think that has a, a momentum behind it for Manchester beyond where it's already going to go, and for other parts of the country, including where I work in the West Mids. Um, but your point about, you know, isn't it great for Whitehall? to have that sort of single focus where you could, of course, flip that the other way. Wouldn't it be great for local decision makers to have a clear line of sight to Whitehall in exactly the opposite way of the descriptions that, that Jess set out? And so, you know what I'm going to ask, Sharon? What is going to be different this time for Whitehall to get his act together to behave fundamentally differently? And however it ends up, whether it's partly structural, I don't know if there's a serious agenda this time about departments uh, being, being rationalised or... Uh, reconfigured in some way, but more importantly, as you've all said, culturally, what is what is actually going to make that difference if on the 7th or 8th of May or whenever after that you get the same cadre of senior civil servants looking first and foremost to their individual sector of the state with their three or four big priorities, and frankly, you know, all very interesting what other people are doing, but that's that's pretty secondary. What What is going to change? Martin, uh, Martin Wheatley, I'm the research director of Governor. Um, a, a, probably a related question. I was very struck by uh, Joe's and Jessica's anecdotes about dealing with civil servants in White, which rang true from my own time in a council and LGA. Um, th these are still, in terms of the professionals who work in them, overwhelmingly separate worlds. Uh, isn't there? Uh, isn't it time now for both? central government and local government to think harder about how in really practical terms we build more of a concept of single public service of people circulating uh, between roles in central government and local government so that when we come to have the practical conversations that need to happen and I very much agree with you Joe about that um, people people are not staring at each other as sort of each way on as kind of strange beasts that they can't, you know, they find that they struggle to do business with. Uh, just take one more question um, from the gentleman there with the glasses. Yes, um, I'm Robert Morland. I've actually been a councillor on two councils. Um, I, I should tell you, I'm one of the few chairmen of governors of school who have written saying how awful the Ofsted report was because it told us we were far wonderful. And I'm actually on the Canal and Rivers Trust, a regional partnership, which, and I was actually, I'm actually amazed how centralized it was. In other words, 95% of the contracts are national. The people who take your weeds in off the Leeds and Liverpool are the same company who do it for the Kennet and Avon. Um, and so my questions which come from that are really twofold. My all feeling about decentralization has always been, and I have to say it's, I would make this criticism of my political party as well as civil service, of are you really going to let it happen as much as it really ought to happen? Am I still going to find when I go outside the country, as you said, that I'm told you're a very centralized country? Um, and secondly, what I found rather lacking in what you said was actually where is the role of the local elected person? I was amazed when I was a councillor, the, the limit actually that was on me. I was chairman of planning. And most of what you have to do is um, basically what your planning staff tell you and they will tell you if you don't do this, you will get appeals and God knows what, and indeed the Secretary of State wants ringing me up to complain. I mean, you don't get away with it. So I think there's a lot more surely in terms of the accountability that you need to do there. Very good, so three questions to pick off there. 
Um, who wants to take the first <coughs> one on how whether Whitehall will actually work differently? And I think it was slightly directed towards uh, Sharon. So, um. I mean, I'm sure St Stephen's guess or expectations is you know as good as mine. I mean, it's been, been quite interesting. This government has shown very little appetite for machinery of government changes. The previous government actually very high appetite, partly driven by Stephen's point about can we create um, the cross-government units. Um, but it was the social exclusion unit, the Office for Criminal Justice Reform, there were lots of examples um, attempting to work across um, the silos with more or less uh, success. I mean, I tend to be quite a glass half full person, and I think that's partly because of the, of the financial situation, in that um, you know, whether or not there are big organisational changes or not, the transaction costs of operating in very siloed, <laughs> uncollegiate ways. I mean, none of us can, af none of us can afford that. And you, and you can, sp you, I mean, I'm sure you see this probably more locally than centrally, but even in central government, you can begin to see um, people beginning to work a bit more collegiately. I think some of the discussions we've had between the social <coughs> care and healthcare boundary over the last while, whether one loves the Better Care Fund or not, um, I think people are beginning to see these much stronger incentives. Actually, if you really care about the patient or the customer at the end of this, we can't afford to, 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 to waste the money in the overheads having endless separate discussions. So I'm, I'm personally quite optimistic. You know, whether redesigning Whitehall is going to be a help or a hindrance or a political priority, I think we'll wait to see until mm -hmm. sometime in May. I mean, one thing the Institute's argued for, actually, is that if you're serious about decentralisation, as well as pre-commitments in manifesto and you know, designated funds and designated powers, is that you do need to think about the spending review process and how that's really going to work in practice when basically local players don't have a voice at the table. Mm -hmm. And how any negotiation goes when someone's not at the table is probably not very well. So thinking about how that, how that process is really going to work di differently next time, time, time is, is obviously an important component of how you create the collaborative culture and in a different way, a way of doing Although things. personally I would disagree that you know although local voices aren't physically at the table you know clearly a huge part of the dynamic in a in a in a spending review negotiation is is what impact this is going to have to have locally and those discussions with CLG but more broadly because most government departments most of the spending is done at a local level so I would I would I would disagree with, um, with the premise. Anyone want to pick up Martin's point about separate worlds and the need to sort of bring uh, these different parts of public service much more closer into collaboration and, and interaction? I mean, I'll, I'll pick that up for a I, I think that follows on from, from Sharon's point. Um, and, and actually through that city deal there was some fantastic working with, uh, with people in different departments saying, you know, you, this is the reality that XYZ department are in, uh, let me help you get in there. Uh, I had the same issues in my same organisation. When I talked about leadership this morning, what we were talking about is in a world with a lot less resources, how do we kind of move out the blocking behaviour, um, which, which isn't necessarily because people are bad people, it's because they're still focused on 10 widgets, but actually I don't need 10 widgets anymore. I want someone to say, what's the answer in a world without widgets? Um, and uh, so, so there, there, is, there is something about us, and I think that's, that's where some of the economic, spatial economic geography gives us an opportunity. There is, um, it, it seems to me that we shouldn't have one, one size fits all. Um, I think it's inordinately difficult for, for government to nail, you know, we had the region stuff, but to speak with 39 LEP areas, is that really realistic? Um, that's an awful lot of conversations. Somehow at that region, at that spatial economic level, whatever it is, you know, and Yorkshire number has as many people as Scotland, um, then we need to be able to have that conversation that understands within the context of UK PLC and what we're trying to achieve for UK UK PLC, what can we do as the state in Team Yorkshire or Team whatever it is, Team Manchester, to make it the best it can be. And some of that's about leadership, it's also <coughs> about processes and cultures and behaviours and it's our job as leaders to make that happen I think. So the uh, third question from Robert was, uh, was about really, a, I mean, there was two questions there. One was about is this, is this going to be serious, but then 
I think the key question was there about what's the role of local elected mm. uh, local, local elected uh, representatives here vis-a-vis -vis officials I think and vis-a-vis -vis national government yeah no I think it's I mean uh, I could have I could have spent my whole time talking about that so I'm not mentioning it but um, uh, dangerous if I start I'll, I'll, I won't stop so Tom will have to chair me because I I feel very strongly about this that that, that we need far more um, sort of respect and attention and support play, paid to the role of elected councillors but it needs to fundamentally change because it's in a different world and if we want <laughs> councillors who can engage with these different um, big things we also want, who want ones who can um, help communities um, get into a different way of engaging with public services and a different sort of place and you know I work with a lot of councillors um, over, the, over the last uh, few years at CFBS and and you know many are brilliant many are not up to that this kind of new world and are not in a place that is ready to say yeah I accept that the world has moved on and they haven't but there are many difficulties in the process of recruiting new ones and one of the frustrations I've, I've had for a long time is that um, council officers um, uh, I'm about to join their ranks so I'm going to change my view by when I get there but um, uh, council officers tend to just complain about the quality of their councillors and say it's all so bloody unfair you know we just get this pile of old rubbish that turn up every four years and w what can we do about it it's all it's all political it's all the parties we hate it if only we could run a nice little authority if only we didn't have them um, <laughs> getting in the way and but they don't ever do anything about it you know they just leave it to the political parties which when we know that political parties are a much weaker force a smaller force um, it's very random who they might put up as candidates and it's random what they, so I do think there's a role um, to promote local democracy and um, for local authorities to get and ca officials to get much more engaged with in terms of developing supporting trying to attract more people in and to pay attention to supporting the role of councillors because I think councillors can do really great things and can speak for their communities um, but they need support to do it and I, I thought it was very interesting that when the Treasury did an assessment of how much our local PACs proposal might cost they came up with a figure of 70 million what if you just put 70 million into supporting councillors now you'd have a very different place I mean you know very different picture and I think uh, you know um, so you, you know you you've got to value your governance systems and the role of elected representatives and support them. Uh, otherwise, surprise, surprise, it's, it's maybe not very good. You know, I think it needs more, much more attention and value. You, you get what you pay for. Um, <laughs> so some, some more questions from the floor, please. Um, very good, so we've got uh, one, one, one down here first, then one there. Uh, so Kerry, if you just go to the uh, uh, just uh, behind and then there. So you there. Um, I think at least a couple of you talked about leadership and uh, um, what do you think about having a common approach to leadership, i.e. collaborative leadership, which some people call is a management shift to level four? Have you got a shared view of what collaborative leadership actually is? Uh, my name's John Cartledge. If today's council is a pile of old rubbish, it's 40 years since I was a councillor, so I suspect that makes me pretty antique rubbish. Um, but casting my mind back to that experience, one of the most frustrating uh, situations I found myself encountering regularly, when issues arose, problems arose, my constituents had difficulties with delivery of particular services and wanted me as their representative to take some action to establish what had gone wrong and why was in the relation to what were known in those days as agency powers, where one authority had the responsibility, but it had delegated it to another level of local authority, actually to do the delivery on the ground. And that was the most wonderful opportunity for buck passing, because responsibility never rested anywhere. The authority that made the delegation washed its hands of the delivery of the service, and the authority that actually had to deliver it said it was all the fault of the higher authority that hadn't given it the powers or the remit that it required. But it was impossible to discover where decisions actually were taken. So I would make a very strong plea on the basis of that experience. <coughs> collaboration between authorities, cooperation is clearly necessary, but there's got to be clarity as to who is responsible for what and where the, where the powers actually lie. And what runs in parallel that was the point that Sharon was raising, which hasn't come up in the discussion very much so far, as to where is the money coming from? Because at the end of the day, being responsible for something but having no funds to deliver it means that you're the target of all the criticism, but there's nothing that you can do about it. So I'm a strong believer in local authorities are having very clearly defined functions and accountabilities and raising and spending the money that they need in order to deliver it and being democratically accountable to their electorates for that. And all the complexities of the systems that have been described this evening 
seem to me to be dragging us away from that simple model and building up trouble for the future. Can you just pass the microphone behind you as well for the third question? Um, Sue Higgins, National Audit Office. Um, but my comment and question is from the perspective of being a statutory officer in a number of local authorities, including the one Jess is about to join, and being a DG in central government. And um, it's the point around transparency and being struck by the difference as a senior of official in the two scenarios. So in local government, you have public decision making. You're there as an official, in my case, with a fiduciary duty to the taxpayer. You're there to serve all members of the council. You go into central government, you're there to serve government of the day. And the advice that you give to your ministers is pretty much non-FOIable. In local government, it's much more transparent decision making, in my view. Um, and the, 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 so for me, it's the whole thing around transparency and decision making and the clear accountabil clearer accountability models I think you've got in local government. And um, I just wonder, uh, I mean, I'm kind of with Stephen about sort of the Whitehall and, 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 and the siloed nature and the, the, all of that needing to change. But I think inherently you've got, um, you know, in answer to that question, inherently the model that, that, that's in operation in local government is more transparent. The relationship between the politicians and the senior officials is on a slightly different basis because the statutory roles, um, I mean, you, you always are led by your politicians. That goes without saying. All officials want to serve their, their, um, their elected members, but you've got a cabinet of, say, eight to ten people or a mayor cabinet of government, 30 odd people. Most of the decisions are, don't go anywhere near parliament. They're done within the department. I just wonder what the panel thought about the actual model of government, local and central. Very good. So three, three knotty questions. Uh, collaborative leadership, um, how to avoid buck passing, and um, uh, how to get uh, more transparency and, and which models of government are, are better. Anyone want to pick off those huge topics? <laughs> <laughs> what about collaborative leadership first? Any thoughts on that? I, is, that a, is that a question to me? I think it was, I think you talked it? about it a bit in your presentation. Yeah, so um, at, a, at a place level, um, all of the players in Doncaster, and I, by that I mean the kind of business leadership, um, voluntary sector leadership, different public agencies, uh, we, we've, this is going to sound really dull, but we, we've kind of tried to sign up to, in performance terms, you know, w what outcomes are we trying to change as, as, a, as a team? Because we, you know, uh, health, um, can um, pub, you know the, the way to change public health? Frankly, is to give people a job and a decent house as much as it is uh, things around uh, around smoking cessation. You can use your planning powers around public health and obesity. So we've we've tried to sign up to a series of the of the, the outcomes we're going to change the individual. So that's the kind of you know who's accountable for it, who's responsible, what are the individual bits we're all going to do to make that happen, and therefore what are the types of leadership behaviours. We need to exemplify to do that. Um, and uh, the next stage in the plan is to uh, design a leadership program that runs across our organisations to do that. But in terms of things like the Better Care Fund, where we are using those as system change, um, what we are doing, as the phrase we use as Team Doncaster, is the uh, individuals, and it doesn't matter what agency they're in, they problem solve in the same way and they are empowered to, uh, to come up with the answers and not to have to go back to base and ask senior managers for permission. So whilst we might not have the workforce development program to get there, uh, I think we've adopted the systems and processes to, to move that on quite considerably. We have a challenge to uh, do some of that at city region level and, and I think the, the move to a combined authority, whereas perhaps first of all we talked about core cities and key cities and city deals, meaning a city rather than necessarily a city region. Uh, I think as, as we've matured through our working and deal type arrangements, we are understanding the need for more collaborative leadership at that city region place level as well. Now, Jessica, I, I can't help but feeling you're sitting on, sitting on the fence a little bit about this complexity question. And when you showed the sort of overlapping boundaries of different uh, parts of mm. the health health system, there was a sort of uh, <coughs> sense in which I think you were saying this surely can't be, surely mm. can't be right. So um, going to this question of, of buck passing and, and how to avoid mm. that, mm. do you have any sort of strong <laughs> views on some principles that we should actually be trying to pay attention to as, this system, as, these, mm. as these governance systems evolve? Yeah. 
Well, I mean, I mean, I think the um, they're not there anymore. The um, the three principles that I put up at, um, at the end of my talk really are are the crucial ones, and they you know they reflect on some things Joe's just been saying. But designing your system of governance and asking yourself, you know, will it help us? Be more inclusive and involve the public, um, you know, or, or will it, or will it actually make it more difficult for the public to get involved? And trying to make that part of the whole system rather than as, I mean, what you, you've seen this of the NHS is that there's a patient and public involvement team, and they do patient and public involvement, but meanwhile your consultants are just uh, operating in the same way the consultants all, always have. So you know, it's, it's trying to make it part of your whole. You know, system of, of decision making, and I, I think that um, picks up on the, the this 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 point about um, you know commissioning services in different ways, getting other providers, and this is what if we're seeing this, and if this is going to be more of the pattern of delivery of you know a completing increasingly um, you know varied economy of delivery of public services from all sorts of different in all sorts of different ways, whether it's partnerships and collaboration or or commissioning and contracts, then uh, you know I think. Um, that those questions have to be built into the start of you thinking about how you're going to deliver a service, uh, rather than being, as I said, being an afterthought and saying, "Oh well, we're now we're going to we're now we've contracted the service to this organisation. We better think about how we're going to involve the service users or consult them on how it's going to be delivered." Well, it's completely the wrong way around, and um, those things need to be built in. Otherwise, there are ways of hiding, and we've we've um, long produced um, you know advice for scrutiny committees on how to <coughs> access. Uh, information from services that are contracted out, and, and uh, if if a contractor and indeed a client wants to be obstructive, if it hasn't been written into the contract at the start that they're required to come and you know account for themselves in in a public meeting uh, in you know in the open, then they they'll find a way not to do it. So, um, you know, building these things in at the start is really important. And Sharon, did you want to come back on any of those <coughs> questions? observation I wanted to make is around Sue's point about the, the different relationship between officials and politicians locally and, and in central government. And it is very striking from the experience of Sue and others, Caroline Downs, Jonathan Slater, Lynn Homer, who've come from very senior positions in, in local government into central government. You know, the fact that you are serving you know, the government of the day, and I'm just interested as to whether that makes for less continuity through electoral cycles because particularly as we've moved to a, or have, have in recent times moved to a position where you've had very long, you know, very long periods in central government of a single party, so you've had less the situation in the 70s, actually of having actually quite a lot of continuity in the relationships between civil servants and politicians because you were out for four years, but you're you know, back for the next four. So I mean, it's, a, it's a question, I think, whether it makes for, for better government uh, for greater continuity, particularly given the questions earlier about whether decentralisation is a fad, uh, the, the system we have in local government vis-a-vis -vis central government. the accountant officer to parliament seems very narrow and uh, as you say not not widely drawn and not inclusive and sort of where, where are the public you know they, their elections are too just at local level but at national level i think there's something there while i go back for the final couple of questions i'm going to ask my panel to have a think about their answer to the question of how to make sure i think it's like rephrasing this question how to make sure that decentralization if de decentralization happens it does lead to better more accountable government you're sort of one, one or two takeaways for the audience today. But we'll have a, a couple of questions from uh, Winnie there, um, and then this lady here, and then uh, there. And there, let's, do, let's give you four. You look so disappointed. You obviously had a really good question. I, I'll let you back in. Um. Uh, Winnie Agbon Lahore, freelance journalist. I've covered central government for just three years, and the amount of times people have mentioned the words culture and leadership is enormous when it comes to improving things. But if I'm a senior civil servant or a local government leader and you're telling me the only way we can achieve improvement is by changing culture and behaviours and getting better leadership, I don't think I could do much with that. So I wondered if you had any, any advice as to how you actually achieve those things. How do you change a culture in, 
in local across local governments, but also in Whitehall. And how do you how do you change things like that? Just because we weren't broad enough, we've now got we've got to do got to do our tips on culture change. Uh, sorry, the next. Uh, Mary Dzhevsky, uh, another journalist. Um, I've got a point and a question. Um, the point would just be to add to what's been said about the patchwork. Um, I think it was um, there was a question about whether it it might be okay as it actually works, but in terms of the um, people looking at it and looking for transparency and accountability, um, I would add their um, convenience for the people using it. I mean, you know, that the health districts and the uh, and the local authorities do not coincide in a lot of places, including in London. This makes it a complete nightmare if you have as a lot of people do, somebody who actually uses both, uh, both services. Um, the question, um, this is going to sound a bit re re really a bit uh, daft in a way, um, but I just wonder, um, there's been a lot of talk here from the platform about co-designing, col uh, collaborative leadership, um, teamwork, all these sort of things, um, and we've got three women on the panel, um, which is quite rare, um, and I just wonder whether we would hear that sort of language from um, an entirely male panel. Um, and I would add that there's actually an interesting page in the standard um, that sort of reminded me of this, um, which talks about pooling talent. Um, and I'll just show it to you. It says, the changing place of work as co-workers share talents. And the picture is, of course, of a woman. Very good. So, the, is there is there a gendered component to our emphasis on collaboration? Um, I think I think we've it's been around for a while. Um, so we've got a question there, and then one at the neck as well. So. Be thinking about your final. Uh, Tim Miller from the local government ombudsman. Um, I think quite rightly, Whitehall is often challenged to demonstrate their real commitment to decentralisation. But I wonder whether we sometimes let Parliament off the hook on this. That actually, if we if we seriously want local accountability, local scrutiny, Parliament themselves have to demonstrate their trust in locally elected representatives. And I think we've already had the point raised of Parliament kind of calling people in to look at um, local authority pay, for example. Um, I think it was clear in the kind of the whole devolution debate that Parliament hasn't really got their head around kind of how scrutiny ties in with decentralisation. They haven't yet answered the, the West Lothian question. We're going to soon have things like the West Midlands question, the West Sussex question. And I just wonder whether actually Parliament themselves needs to be challenged much more to show their commitment to decentralisation. Very interesting point. And finally... Uh um, I'm, I'm uh, with a background as a uh, both an officer at a senior level and now a councillor in uh, Jessica's... Uh, uh, authority um, and I guess a frustration at this discussion about the role of local government um, we it, it seems to me absolutely impossible to have place-based accountability without reasserting local government and local governance across the patchwork that Jessica illustrated and I just think we I've seen through my career an evisceration of local government its retreat at every level from education from crime, a whole way from the economy, and it just seems to me that it, the price of that has been centralisation. And until we reassert uh, the, this role of local government, local governance, and incidentally turn the councillors, who I just, I don't see this appalling range of people, I see some very talented councillors, I see a culture in local government, a very frustrating one, in which one does not communicate to the other. Local government officers, and what a, a giveaway that word is in itself, uh, not colleagues in tackling uh, things. And so the two cultures are still a, a sin, in my view, between members and officers uh, within local government. And until we overcome that and turn councillors into someone, people who can cover the full range of, 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 uh, of services locally, uh, then we will g continue to get the centralisation that we've, uh, we've had over the last 30, 40 years. Very good. So fortunately, we've had a couple of very, uh, very powerful comments there, one on uh, the role of Parliament, need Parliament needing to think much more seriously about its role in scrutiny. Um, the other, I think, more about 
the local government actually just, you know, us, have we ceded too much ground here or with all these different locally elected figures in policing and, and increasing powers to national government in other areas. Um, but there were questions there, a couple of questions there around culture and I think sort of collaboration and the, the role of gender within that. And then I think also start thinking about your final remarks and if you want to wrap them into your answers to these questions, feel free to do so. Anyone want to pick up any of those? I should be very brief. I, you know, as a Treasury person, woman, I didn't mention collaboration, obviously, because I think the Treasury probably trump it trumps gender. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I, mean, the, I mean, the only comment I was going to make really is around sort of culture change, which, like you, I sort of struggle a bit with because it all feels very sort of blah, 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 important, but blah, 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 like. Um, and it's a bit of a tr you know, sort of trite truism, but unless the leadership is there, I mean, for me, cultural change is that we're doing X and we need to be changing the direction and how do you bring people with you? Uh, and that is, I mean, it's incredibly difficult to do in a single party across a coalition, but you've got to have the commitment to do that from the top and know where you're, where you're trying to lead to and the public's with you. Um, and I guess my sort of very brief response to Sir Tom's exam question on decentralisation and better government, I mean, I'm an official, not a politician, to respond to this, really, but I think there is something here about you know, responsiveness to the end user, and I thought Mary's point, just bringing it to home, you know, how if you, are in, you know, if you are an older person receiving social care and healthcare services, and we have a boundary for historic and convenience reasons, doesn't work for the individual, actually that's a really good success criterion as to whether we're able to break through that very, very basic disjuncture. I'm going to try and wrap them all up in one go. Clearly the movie and the song of the day is Frozen and Let It Go. Mm -hmm. um, I think in terms of culture, and I am conscious that it sounds nebulous, but it, it, it does just need to be the way we do stuff around here. And that means for me, some of the stuff around doing deals, some of the stuff around managing risk, uh, what you want to do around transparency and processes, how you recruit people, how you measure them. It, it's, it's, it's a mixture of, of, of hard stuff and soft stuff. Uh, that go together. I, I wouldn't begin to answer a question on gender. I've worked with some amazing men and women and some pretty awful ones. Um, I, uh, I do think, though, that um, just in the context of, of, of governance, and the Treasury does, does trump all, uh, and if I was uh, Treasury, I might be, you know, I, I don't think the current situation, I, I described what was happening in winter pressures there, for example. Um, protecting health and not dealing with social care is, is, is a it's just a train that's about to go off the track. Um, I don't think there's a single honest conversation going on in this country um, about the state of the state and the state we can afford in the future. Not a single honest conversation. Uh, and this, that makes this country feel quite mean. Um, and so uh, I think it's time to have them. And actually, if you know, I don't know what my plan is after 2017. Uh, I can work out, I've, I've got a plan to get to there, but. Blimey, if that's hard, only halfway through austerity and what we've really got to do with the rest, I, I am struggling with the plan after that. Uh, and actually, if I was the Treasury, I'd be wanting to use local governance. And I'm not so fond of saying it's all about local government because I do think leadership is earned, and that's certainly <coughs> the, the experience of our improvement journey. Then I would be wanting local government to be at the heart of that kind of place-based way of taking some money out of the system and making it work because we cannot go on as we are. Very good. And Jess, finally to you. Okay, yeah, I mean, I think one of the, the things about, about, about culture is that it, it's, a, it's an evolving thing. You can't just have one thing that's one thing that will fit all. So sometimes, you know, teamwork, let's all have a hug, let's all work together in a beautiful, maybe gendered way. I don't know. Sometimes that's not appropriate. Sometimes you just have to do it and you need a more command and control thing. But it's about being aware of what, what the necessary culture is for your organisation and how, you, how you're going to work, how you're going to do business around here. So I think it's something that leaders have to be always alive to and use different approaches um, as, as is appropriate for where an organisation and a, 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 you know, where the plan is on its, on it, on its journey. So, <coughs> so I think there isn't a single thing, but it's just you have to both do stuff that needs to be done now and be working towards where you want to get to. So it's just those leadership skills of looking ahead for the longer term whilst also fixing the things that need fixing straight away. So you know, it's, I guess it's not easy, but sometimes you just have to do, do everything all at once. Um, and I, you know, I think absolutely um, what Nick was saying that 
you know, putting elected councillors back at the heart of these things, you know, has, has to be the way forward. But I do think um, uh, local government in London is very different to local government elsewhere. Um, I'd say that the, the demographics of the councillor population is very different. Um, you know, my borough where I live has a turnover of population of 25% or so every um, every time um, that may be slowing down as people stay longer because the schools are better, but it's nonetheless there's a there's a turnover <coughs> and a churn and a, an age difference. Um, so it is different around the country in different places, but nonetheless, despite that, councillors still need to be at the heart of it because it is about having an elected mandate. So so part of my solution is about where are councillors, but where are they in bringing together all of the other partners? And I think. Joe's example of dealing with winter pressures is, is exactly what we need to do across all the, all the services. Um, it is about seeing what a problem is and how can we work together to, 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 to solve the problem. So, and I think the, the answer to that solution is partly what Manchester have done. Um, so looking to Manchester, but not just saying, oh, well, they got a combined authority and that therefore got them lots of power, so let's all have a combined authority. Actually, it's all based on a decade of working together as a set of organisations and um, the authorities that aren't Manchester City Council within that, that area being big enough to accept that it is Greater Manchester and not Greater something else, and in Manchester being knowing when to sit back. So <coughs> it's that, that collective leadership. So I think learning, learning the right lessons from Manchester's success has got to be part of that, but designing in some thinking about um, where do local councillors sit and where does accountability and transparency and involvement sit in that right at the start uh, and not leaving it to the end of the process. Thank you very much. That was a huge, broad and wide-ranging discussion, so there'll be plenty to talk about over drinks. Um, can we just end by uh, thanking the panel in our usual way?